do, do. There we go. All right, cool. So he thought they were going to tell him you know, like how great America is, how terrible these commie bastards are, and how America needs to keep fighting the war against communism in the Cold War in the 1970s. He doesn't do that. He, who's fluent in English, comes out and gives a speech in Russian with a translator. Uh, we can look at a little video of the speech in a minute here. He gives a video dressed more or less in like a green fatigue, like he looks like Fidel Castro with a huge beard more or less, right? He gives it in Russian, and it's called the exhaustion of the West, where he criticizes what's going on in Western society, especially America, following World War II. So it seems odd because he's a Russian who America has more or less saved and given asylum to, who's writing about how evil Russia is, and we're like, why is he telling us that we have problems? So everybody was pissed off about it. The Harvard Examiner, who publishes all the freaking like commencement speeches ever, refuses to publish it for a number of years. Jackie Kennedy's pissed, writes a letter to the editor of the New York Times. The president's pissed. Solzhenitsyn kind of gets, goes underground for a while while he like clears up his reputation with the presidency and the United States government. But after a couple of years, it becomes more accepted that what he was saying was actually like not only true but prophetic. And like if we had listened to him, maybe we'd have done better off with like our foreign policy decisions in the 70s and 80s. I also think that the, and the reason we're reading this is it's rather pathetic about what's going on today with our, like, the idea of culture, the media, political, social figures, right, and the amount of outsized power they have on the American perception of the world, and so that we kind of end up doing some not brilliant things, not because we don't think it's the right thing to do, but because we lack, as a society, right, the courage to actually say what we're doing might be stupid or wrong. We kind of go along with what happened before like sheeple or like lemmings or whatever you want to say. And he kind of says this in 1978 and pisses everybody off. So I think it's a great speech just because of that. It was really like, you know, he had some cojones to get up there, give a speech in Russian at Harvard about the United States and uh, not really care where the cards fell. So let me pull up an introduction. So this is an introduction to his biography that goes more in depth than I did by again, Jordan Peterson. I don't know if you know who he is, if you like him, if not. He wrote the introduction to the new edition of Gulag Archipelago, and his interesting um, take on just Solzhenitsyn's life. I don't know much about him as a, you know, he, I guess he's a public figure who said some crazy stuff, but he's a decent author for this introduction. So we're going to listen to a little bit about this, uh, the historical context of Gulag Archipelago, not all 47 minutes, like the first five. And then we'll go on and read the, the speech that he's giving because he wrote this book. Now, the Gulag, right, everybody knows this first off, is like the, Russian internment hard work concentration camp where they sent people to go die in Siberia at like negative 40 degree weather, right? That's a gulag. An archipelago is a word for a chain of islands. So like you have like the Florida Keys or an archipelago, right? A bunch of little islands scattered all along the coastline. So his idea is that the gulag, since there's so many of them scattered all across the frontiers of Russia and Siberia, they more or less are like an island chain, right? An island chain of evil where the people from the cities go when the government is done with them and wants to you know, go away and freeze forever. So that's the name of the book, and that's why it was titled that. Let me play a bit of this. I'm trying to juggle two computers. I don't know how to use either one. Let's see. Let me find that. It's like 1,400 pages long. It's massively long. It's a couple years ago. Here's a brief biography of the author, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, from the book. Solzhenitsyn was born in 1918 and grew up in Rostov on Dawn. He graduated in physics and mathematics from Rostov University and studied literature by correspondence course at Moscow University. 
In World War II, he fought as an artillery officer, attaining the rank of captain. I know he was a captain. So in that's 1945, good however, after making derogatory remarks about Stalin in a letter, he was arrested and summarily sentenced to eight years in forced labor camps, followed by internal exile. In 1957, he was formally rehabilitated and settled down to teaching and writing. That what happens when you go to a labor camp for enough time that like you've been formally re-educated, like we've like brainwashed you enough that you're not going to say bad crap about Stalin anymore. You can come back to like in a Russian city. Volumes one, two, and three. A vast canvas of camps, prisons, transit centers, and secret police of informers and spies and interrogators but also of everyday heroism. The Gulag Archipelago is Alexander Solzhenitsyn's grand masterwork. Based on the testimony of some 200 survivors and on the recollection of Solzhenitsyn's own 11 years in labor camps in exile, it chronicles the story of those at the heart of the Soviet Union who opposed Stalin, for whom the key to survival lay not in hope, but in despair. The thoroughly research document and a feat of literary and imaginative power. This edition of the Gulag Archipelago was abridged into one volume at the author's wish and with his full cooperation. Doris Lessing, 1919-2013, a British novelist, playwright, librettist, biographer, and short story writer. The British means they write opera. 2007 Nobel Prize for Literature says of the Gulag Archipelago, it helped to bring down an empire. Its importance can hardly be exaggerated. This is Solzhenitsyn's own forward to the original abridgment. I dedicate this to all those who did not live to tell it. And may they please forgive me for not having seen it all, nor remembered it all, for not having divided it all. If it were possible for any nation to fathom another people's bitter experience through a book, how much easier its future fate would become, and how many calamities and mistakes it could avoid. But it is very difficult. There always is this fallacious belief. It would not be the same here. Here, such things are impossible. Alas, all the evil of the 20th century is possible everywhere on Earth. Yet I have not given up all hope that human beings and nations may be able, in spite of all, to learn from the experience of other people without having to live through it personally. Therefore, I gratefully accept Professor Erickson's suggestion to create a one-volume abridgment of my three-volume work, The Gulag Archipelago, in order to facilitate its reading for those who do not have much time in this hectic century. It's still like 300 pages long. I thank Professor Erickson for his generous initiative as well as for the tactfulness, the literary taste, and the understanding of Western readers which he displayed during the work on the abridgment. Edward E. Erickson. Oh, good for you. Let me pull the actual text up, we'll look at it. So, basically, right, he's saying that the whole purpose of the Gulag Archipelago in Solar Souls and Nietzsche was concerned is to prevent people from countries from repeating Russia's mistake, right? which kind of makes sense in the context of the speech we're about to look at because he's kind of trying to tell America not to make the same, not make the same mistakes Russia made, he thinks, right? But there's other mistakes he kind of has seen being an outsider who's in America, right? He's like, okay, let me tell you about yourself a little bit so maybe you don't do another crazy thing different than what Russia did, but still just as crazy and just as dangerous and just as harmful ostensibly to the world. Uh, 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 there you go. Wait, no. I hate this whole like window thing being unseeable on my screen. Of oh, course, cool. there we go. And announcement. So I posted up here too for people to refer to. And if anybody wants the Goldberger essay, also right there is the link to that for your reference. Cool. Ta da! So there he is in his little uh, comrade. Uh, Castro outfit, right? I'm just gonna let you see the how he looks. There you go. Interesting looking guy, right? Kind of looks like I don't know Charles Dickens or Alfred Lord Tennyson if he was a leader of a, you know, a military uh, dictatorship. All right. So, see, 
Let me zoom in a bit so you can see the app. Cool. So again, this is being given to Harvard as a commencement address to the graduating class, right? Harvard's a pretty big deal, or so they say. I didn't go there, so I kind of don't really care. Right. Harvard's motto is Veritas, which means like truth, right? Ever seen the Boondock Saints movie? Kind of a cult movie, maybe? Guy's got Veritas like tattooed across his hand. I don't think he sells anything in Saboom Doc Saints. It's unfortunate. Many of you have already, ah, I can't see it, found out, and others will find out in the course of their lives that truth eludes us and not the glare makes it so I can't see them. Eludes us if we I'm gonna read from my copy, sorry y'all. Do 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 do. Hang on, it's not. Pause one second, y'all, sorry. I'm trying to do two things at once. The Veritas thing is not. All right, the truth eludes us if we do not con concentrate our attention totally on its pursuit. But even while it eludes us, the illusion of knowing it still lingers and leads to many misunderstandings. Also, truth seldom is pleasant. It is almost invariably bitter. There is some bitterness in my today's speech, too. But I want to stress that it comes not from adversary, or adversary but from a friend. Three years ago in the United States, I said certain things which at the time appeared unacceptable. Today, however, many people agree with what I said. So somebody want to read the first paragraph that he says, the split in the world today, or today's world. I'll start picking victims like a despotic Stalinist leader in a second. Yeah. Split in today's world, somebody very volunteered. And we're going to stop and talk about it, what it means, right? So just. I want to get it out there without me killing my eyes by looking up there. Please, thank you. The split in today's world is perceptible when you give them the case to guns. And you invite contemporaries to readily identify as two, uh, two world powers, each of them already capable of entirely destructing the other. However, Russia, and the, sorry. Russia and the US. Sorry. <laughs> However, understanding the split often is limited to this political perception. That danger may be abolished through successful diplomatic or by achieving the balance of our armed forces. The truth is that the split is much more profound, one and more alienated than the other. That the, rift more, that the rifts are more than one can see at first glance. This deep manifold splits bears the danger of manifold disaster for all of us. In accordance with the ancient truths that the kingdom, in this case, our earth, the body against itself cannot stand. Thank you very much. So we're saying, right, this is during the height of the Cold War, right, we're involved in Vietnam, we've been involved in Cambodia and Laos, we had the Korean War already, right, there's nuclear warheads all over Moscow, all over the Russian front, all over Alaska, all over our east and west coast, right, pointed at each other, we're about to, like, at any moment be blown completely away by global thermonuclear war, right, you got drills with kids hiding under their desks with, like, their books over their head in high schools and grade schools, right, because, like, they think it's going to be helpful if a bomb goes off near them to be under their desk. So somebody said once, it's like putting your head between your knees and kissing your butt goodbye is more or less what the drill was, right? And so there's this fear that's going on in the whole world about the Russian ideology winning and the American ideology combating it or trying to triumph against it, right? So we're talking about this split is more than just like, they have guns and don't like us, we have guns and don't like us. There's also something more fundamental about human nature that's splitting the world apart, right? That the military stuff is just a representation of, essentially what he's saying at the beginning of the speech. Somebody from the next pit? There's the concept of the third world. Wait, if I find the right dang mouse, this is going to be a pain in the butt, isn't it? All right. All right. There is the concept of the third world. Please. Could you? Yeah. All right. Yeah. There is the concept of the third world. Thus, we, are, we already have three worlds. Undoubtedly, however, the number is even greater. We are just too far away to see. Any ancient and deeply rooted anonymous culture, especially if it is spread on a wide part of the Earth's surface, constitutes an anonymous world, full of riddles and surprises to Western thinking. As a minimum, we must include in this category China, India, the Muslim world, and Africa, if indeed we accept the approximation of viewing the latter two as compact units. Cool. Thank you very much. 
So what I'm saying here, right, is that you have Russia and America, which are like first world countries, or first and second world, he says, right? And you have everybody else, which is, was called, right, for the longest time, the third world. Now, like, developing nations, we call them, right? Because the whole, like, three separate world thing didn't really make a lot of sense because it made us think that, like, we were better and we're not better because we're all human, right? So that's what he's saying is the concept of the third world, right, is a problem not only because, like, it has this power dynamic that dehumanizes folks, right? But, like, any culture that this exists for itself, by itself, develops by itself, right, is a world by itself. So American culture, British culture, Japanese culture, uh, India, Indi like, as in Hindu culture, right, all that has its own world to it because it has its own history and its own ideas, right? And so to say that there's only two worlds or three worlds is to miss the point. And also those worlds which are more further away from us geographically as the United States, right? We don't really seem to care about very much. Like, we're not really interested in knowing the nuances of, like, the Indus Valley civilization, or of Hindu culture, or of um, Muslim culture, really, at this point in time, right? Because it's like, oh, there's a Muslim world, and then there's where he says Africa, right? Which is obviously an idiot's term. Like, Africa is a million different countries, not a million, but a ton of different countries, cultures, ethnic groups, tribal groups. The whole thing is like a history into itself, right? He's like, America has a way of looking at stuff that says, this is all just one homogenous blob, and it's stupid to do that. You have to look at each place where there's a culture and a people and an idea about the world that's risen up if you actually want to understand it, right? And he says, America's more or less not interested at this point, and pretty much today still, right, understanding really the different places in the world and how their ideologies and how their lives affect our interactions with them, right? That's more or less what he's saying, right? So it's also stupid, he says, to view like the Muslim world, quote unquote, in the Middle East, and to view Africa as compact units. They're not, they're individual autonomous cultures, the same as America or Britain or anything else, right? So he says more or less we're stupid and like labeling things too big, so we don't have to actually think about stuff. Is summary of that. Oh, geez. I need like higher graduate student to come and like move the mouse from me. There we go. Sorry. All right. How short time ago? Somebody read that one? We go from this section. Did you say? Uh, how a short time ago? Okay. Oh wait. Sorry. I lied. Hang on. I just scrolled too far. Saying for a thousand years. My mistake. Autonomous character and therefore never understood. This is today. The West does not understand Russia in the communist capitalism. It may be that in past years, Japan has increasingly became, become a distant part of the West. I have no judge But as the Israel, for instance, it seems to me that it's been out the part on a Western world and that the state system is fundamentally linked to the region. Thank you. That's probably a lot of confusing like political, geopolitical talk, right? What he's saying is like, okay, after World War II, right, Japan was not allowed to have a standing military, military under the um, treaty after World War II. So the Americans put a marine base in Okinawa, Japan, and said, we'll just protect you, Japan, no military for you, no bombs for you, because we don't want to worry about you, right? And so he's saying more or less that made culturally as well as politically Japan essentially like a kind of extension of the West as far as our political and geopolitical security concerns, right? Also he says Israel's more or less the same thing because it's a functioning religious democracy that has the same kind of religious beliefs and it aligns them with the United States on political and like military interests, right? So he's trying to talk about why Russia is not able to be categorized under these kinds of thoughts processes because they're not Western, right? We like to think of like the East-West divide, which is kind of pointless, except for the examples of the US putting its like presence in Israel or its military protection in Israel or in Japan, where like the country then becomes politically more aligned with the United States because, well, we have our guns there, et cetera, right? So we're saying that we can't understand Russia along the same kinds of lines, right? Because we never understood them before, and we make them understand them in our captivity either. All right, so how a short time ago, Anticipate. Also, the 
What the hell? Frayability. Like when you have a rope that like frays, right? Frayability. I think he might have made it up. I don't, actually, he didn't. Right? So we're saying like, look, we had this whole colonialist project, this Britain, Spain, du Holland, right? Not Dutchland. Holland, right? Which is the Dutch people, right? Had colonies all over the world, right? You had British colonies in India and America. You had colonies from Spain in, the, in um, South America, in Latin America, right? You had colonies from, from, from Holland in Africa, in the Middle East, in the Far East, right? And so the Western expansion is like, y'all kind of just went out there and conquered everything. You really never really crap about what you're conquering, right? We all kind of know the story of colonialism, right? It's not a good thing. The people who lived there before put down a place not valued at all, right? And this is what he's saying. He's like, y'all did a really good job of like putting your ideas everywhere and not thinking about the consequences of doing that, right? You can only do that for so long, right? Because we thought, or he says the West thought, there was a triumph. We went and the flags on the hill. Life is good forever. Well, no, he says. Like, you didn't realize how frayability or fra how frayable or fragile that idea about the world is because the only reason that was possible is because you had a cohesive, like, society that was more or less geared towards the same objective. After time, after you, like, being all fat and happy, he's going to say, right, it kind of goes away because everybody in your country you get, or your Western ideology, right, it's kind of like, you know, complacent and lazy and doesn't really care or think about stuff anymore, and then the value of the cultures you just, like, stepped on, right, or like, hey, we're better than you now, and America's like, crap. What well, if they were better, or are better, right? And that's what he's going to go to, right? The frayability of the American, the Western approach lies in the inability to assimilate or consider what's good or even what's human in the places that were colonized. It's a brief summary there. How is it not? There we go. All right. Now we see that the conquest proved to be short lived. Over here. Over here. I can zoom in more, maybe. Uh, that's all right. You sure? Yeah, I can. Right. We now see that the conquest proved to be short-lived and precarious. precarious. And this, in turn, points to defects in the Western views of the world which led to these conquests. Relations with the former colonial world now have turned into their opposite, and the Western world often goes to extremes of uh, Subservience. But it is difficult yet to estimate the total size of the bill which former colonial countries would present to the West, and it is difficult to predict whether the surrender not only of its last uh, colonies, but of everything it owns, will it be sufficient for the West to put the bill. Thank you very much. You have a saying, saying like, more or less, because of the West in America, and partly after World War II, especially America after World War II, right, has been writing checks on our credibility and our like goodness or whatever, right? And like it hasn't gone well. Like there's people in Russia, in Laos, in Cambodia, in uh, Latin America, right, in Cuba, who are not doing so well under like the American, British, like you know, global balance of power, militarily speaking, right? So they're a little upset now, right? And America and the West have now had to be like maybe colonialism, not such a good thing, oppression of culture, genocide, and kind of not. We're stepping back from that, right? We're not doing only that, but we like lose our moral authority. We're trying to give away whatever we can to like make up for it, right? It's the West, right? Not just Amer American in the sense because we have still have the nuclear weapons at this point, right? But everybody else is kind of okay. Like, sorry, India, we're not going to be colonial anymore. As Britain says, like, well, that's not good enough because you've oppressed for so long and ruined the culture and the world around them for so long that there's not like the account is still negative, even though you've like given back what was once not yours, right? All right. But the blindness of superiority continues in spite of it all and upholds the belief that vast regions everywhere on our planet should be developed and mature at the level of present day Western systems, which in theory are the best in practice and most attractive. This is the belief that all these worlds are only one being temporarily prevented by wicked governance or heavy crises or by their own barbarity and incomprehension from taking the way of the Western pluralistic democracy and from adopting the Western way of life. Countries are judged on the merit of their progress in this direction. However, it is a conception which develops out of Western incomprehension of the essence of the other worlds, 
out of the mistake of measuring them all with a Western yardstick. The real picture of our planet's development is quite different, and which about our divided world gave birth to the theory of convergence between leading Western countries and the Soviet Union. This is a soothing theory which overlooks the fact that these worlds are not at all developing into, sim into similarity. No one can be transformed into the other without the use of violence. Besides, convergence inevitably means acceptance of the other side's defects too, and this is hardly desirable. Right. So we're saying that we have these two worlds split with nuclear weapons, right? There's the idea that we can just talk maybe, right? We can all just come together and combine on. Uh, the Russians will hug us, we'll hug the Russians. Everything will be good, and we'll just in one big happy world family, right? He's saying that's not possible because the West has not understood Russia or much of the other world either. And would you want to go like kumbaya and hung it out with somebody who like was just like telling you how worthless you were and then was like, oh, we can still be friends, right? Like, no, because they don't understand you. They don't know your life. They don't understand anything about you, right? They just want to be friends now that you're becoming like a pain in the ass because they realize they've done wrong stuff to you, right? And so he's like, we can't have this global union because we have global division that has not been addressed yet, right? That make sense? And when saying, we all want to hug it out with somebody who's just like saying terrible stuff about you and was like, wait, give me a hug. It's fine. Like, we'll just forget all that bad crap happened, right? Like, would you do it for Klondike Bob? Probably not, right? All right. And he also says it's not desirable, right? If I were today addressing an audience in my own country, he means Russia, right? Examining the overall pattern of the world's rifts, I would have concentrated on the East calamities. But since my forced exile in the West has now lasted four years, and since my audience is a Western one, I think it may be of greater interest to concentrate on the certain aspects of the West in our days, such as I see them. Maybe she's like, ha, flipping the script, telling about yourself, not about Russia. A declining courage may be the most striking feature which an outsider obser outside observer notices in the West in our days. The Western world has lost its civil courage, both as a whole and separately. In each country, each government, each political party, and of course in the United Nations. Such a decline in courage is particularly noticeable among the ruling groups and the intellectual elite, causing an impression of loss of courage by the entire society. Of course, there are many courageous individuals, but they have no determinant influence on public life. Political and intellectual bureaucrats sow depression, passivity, and perplexity in their actions and in their statements, and even more so in the theoretical reflections to explain how realistic, reasonable, as well as intellectually and even morally worn it is to base poli state policies on weakness and cowardice. And declining courage is ironically emphasized by occasional explosions of anger and inflexibility on the part of the same bureaucrats when dealing with weak governments, with countries not supported by anyone, or with currents which cannot offer any resistance. So what he's saying is like, I don't know, kind of, he's kind of like criticizing the government, like the people, the professors, the ruling intellectuals and elites. I'm not ruling anybody, I'll tell you that much. Um, but the people who are teaching the young folk, right, those who are going to be, you know, educated, who are going to teach other people in the, you know, grade schools, who are going to go out and manage companies, whatever, right? He's like, the people instructing them are full of crap, and they're cowards. Why are they cowards? Because they're like, oh, we are so smart, we can figure out a way to make the policy work with Russia, right? We can deal with, you know, making sure that we have a no proliferation treaty, nuclear bombs don't go off everywhere, right? Because we've taken classes in, you know, Russian language or in foreign policy or in like, you know, political science. He's saying like there's actually a cowardice on these people's parts because they don't want to actually know anything about Russia. They only want to study what we know or think we know about Russia, right? So there's no actually talking, there's no listing that's going on about this like ruling elite, these bureaucrats in the government, these professors in the universities. There's only us echo chambering ourselves and thinking we know what's going on, right? And so there's also there's a, a lack of composure when dealing with like somebody who's not as big and bad as Russia, right? So for example, you have during this time. Iran takes a bunch of hostages from the U.S. the end of the Carter presidency, being in the Reagan presidency, Canada, 74, I think, U.S. citizens, on a plane, flies into Tehran, and we're like, we're going to bomb you, we're going to nuclear bomb you, Iran, like, what are you doing? Oh my God, we can't negotiate with you. Brute force, bomb everything, raise the whole country, right? He's like, that doesn't make sense if you're all so smart and politically, like, into, you know, brilliant, right? Like, this country has no army, has no nuclear weapons, has no real military to hurt you. They took some of your people. Why are you threatening to blow them off the face of the earth like you're a bully or like, you know, a little kid who just got his toy taken away? If you're so genius with your, like, tacticians and your freaking, like, diplomacy, work the problem out. And he's like, no, because a sign of the, like, anger in the moment is that we don't actually know crap about diplomacy or listening to other people, actually caring about other people, cultures, countries, feelings, states, or whatever, right? We just want to be like, hmm, 
plug down, hmm, America good, right, or the West good, right? He says it becomes obvious to everybody else in the world that's going on when we lash out at people who like pose no threat to us, right? You can see that happening like Grenada and Guam, Honduras during this time too. Not that we have to talk about those exactly, but other examples you should look at PD or Google if you want, right? Just to figure out how to use mouses in this kind of there we go. There we go. Okay. I guess I was bumping the table enough that the mouse moved from my other mouse. Right. Should one point out that from the ancient times, the declining courage has been considered the beginning of the end? So I read from the modern Western states. Pursuit, sir. Pursuit tactics. See, for example, the American Declaration of Independence, now at least during half this, the decade, the technological and social progress has permitted the realization of such aspired aspiration, the welfare state. Great. Thank you. So he says, like, the fact that America, more or less, like, if you're not, you know, gainfully employed or whatever, if you have hard times or like you get sick or like lose a leg or whatever, you come back from the military, you get a job, but like we have enough money in America that we can pay for everybody to have at least a basic standard of living. Like you've heard about like universal basic income, right? That like if you took how much money Jeff Bezos has and like took like 1% of it and like gave it to people, everybody would be making like $10,000 a month or something like that. I don't know the mathematics on that, right? But like the idea that we have enough wealth in the country that we don't have to worry about like massive starvation famine in the streets, right, because America's a capitalist power. He's like, okay, so the idea that we're supposed to be fulfilling our own liberty, like living the free life, um, you know, what is it, the uh, Declaration of Independence, right, life, liberty, pursuit, happiness. It's been done, we have happiness. We have more or less life, and we are able to pursue whatever, right? We're in college if we want to be, if not, we're, you know, out around. So he's like, since this has been realized more or less by this welfare store, the ability to provide for ourselves well, first, it has a connotation that it doesn't mean here. He means, like, more or less, like, you have the ability, if you not have enough money for food or whatever, the government or church or somebody can help you. There's not, like, famine and starvation of 80 million people, right? We have the basic ways to support life by other community action or by our own monetary earnings, right? So we got it. We're good. We, we made it to the end, right? Pursuit of happiness for everybody, right? We're good. No. He says no. Every citizen has been granted the desired freedom of material goods in such quantity and of such quality as to guarantee, in theory, the achievement of happiness in the morally inferior sense of the word, which has come into being during these same decades. In the process, however, one psychological detail has been overlooked. The constant desire to have still more things in a still better life and the struggle to attain them imprint many Western force or faces with worry and even depression, though it is customary to conceal such feelings. Active, intense competition fills all human thoughts without opening away the free spiritual development. Right, he's saying we have great stuff. We got Xbox, we got PS2s, we got Xbox Ones, we got PS5s, 4s, Nintendo Switches, right? So like, if we have all this cool stuff and all this entertainment, we got Hulu, we got Netflix, we got Roku, we got YouTube, we got, what else is there? All kinds of stuff, right? We got, you know, online classes, we got Zoom, we got education distance-wise, right? Like, all we want to do now is get more better stuff. The new phone, the new I iPhone 12X or whatever, the Galaxy 4, whatever it is, the dual screen pixel makes Julian Fry's Samsung phone, right? And instead of worrying about like ourselves and what we're doing with these things, right, we just want more stuff. All right, that's his argument here. Right? I think it can be kind of true. So like what if, you know, you got a new Xbox One or Xbox 4, whatever it is, right? You got the new rock band game, you got some little fake guitar. Sitting there at home or in the dorm room playing your little rock band guitar, right? Good stuff. Download all the songs in the world you want, some Megadeth, some Garth Brooks, whatever it is. And a war starts. And we have a volunteer military in the United States, right? Like, who would be like, you know, I'm going to give my nice warm dorm room and my Guitar Hero, and my Xbox One, and my classes, and my, you know, COVID face mask and everything to, like, go fight in, I don't know, Kamchatka or Timbuktu or the North Pole, right? And be miserable against an enemy I don't even know or care about, right? Like, who would do that? It's like, probably nobody, because life is good here, right? 
People like have a pretty hard time saying, no more Xbox One, I'm gonna go, you know, be in Siberia for 40 years or 40 days, whatever, in the cold as a free choice, right? And since America doesn't have a draft, he's like, we're getting soft, kind of, right? He's like, everybody's sitting there playing Xboxes and getting soft, not having courage to like, not just like fight like a war, right? But just, we like being comfortable, right? All right. The individual's independence from many types of state pressure has been guaranteed. The majority, like we don't have secret police like following us around and trying to like snatch us up in black helicopters, well, usually, right? Um, the majority of people have been guaranteed well-being to an extent that their fathers and grandfathers could not even dream about. It has become possible to raise young people according to these ideals, leaving them to physical splendor, happiness, and possession of material goods, money, and leisure to an almost unlimited freedom of enjoyment. So who should now renounce all this, and why? And for what should one risk one's precious life in defense of common values, and particularly in such nebulous cases that the security of one's nation must be defended in a distant country? Even biology knows that habitual extreme safety and well-being are not advantageous for a living organism. Today, well-being in the life of the Western society has begun to reveal that pernicious mass. What does he mean by evolution or biology knows that like, prolonged safety is not advantageous to a life form? Maybe that's too much. Your biology, right? You know, like things like life growing right cells and wolf packs and, you know, fetal pigs you have to dissect. Why is it bad if a species, uh, even just like one wolf or one amoeba, is like totally protected its whole life and has no kind of like adversity? There's just like food pellets coming out of the freaking ceiling for the rat or for the wolf, right? Or the amoeba just has all kinds of amoeba little goody things around him, right? Or her. What's dangerous for that life form in those circumstances? You ever hear the Bubble Boy movie concept? Maybe this is COVID. Like, so the dude like was born and his parents wanted to protect him from like the whole world. So like, like made this big like hamster wheel. It's a bubble, right? He might have been in that movie. You mean like him as a person? Oh, I didn't know he was a Bubble Boy as a person. Or he was acting as the Bubble Boy in the movie. Oh, okay. I thought you meant Jake Gyllenhaal built himself a bubble. Yeah. Oh. Then, yeah, I think that's probably him in that movie. I'd believe that. But, yeah. To protect him from everything in the world, right? But what the problem is, you have no contact with the outside world then, right? You have to, like, drop food in through your little bubble hole or whatever, right? You have no ways to evaluate and appreciate things that are possibly dangerous to you and no ways to grow beyond your present state of being, right? What he means is, like, okay, if you're a species of moth, right, and you're in the wilderness in Britain, right, and the trees are all white, right? Then the moths who are white have an advantageous evolutionary characteristic because all the moths who have a you know, different genetic thing are easier to see against the tree bark, right? So then a factory moves in and soot starts falling from the air, right? All the trees turn black. All of a sudden, all them white moths are easier to see and get eaten up by all the birds, right? And so then the moths who are genetically like, darker, like they have the recessive gene, right? Are the only ones left. And so they start repopulating more than the white moths. And so now you have only black moths on the trees, right? And so you're saying like, those white moths are effing up because they're not actually encountering any danger. They're protected from everything, right? And because they're protected from everything, they're doomed to be destroyed really quickly by, you know, the unexpected, right? He's saying, so even biology says the same thing I'm saying, that get off your Xbox One and start, I don't know, doing push up. I don't know what he's saying, man. He's not saying like, you need to do anything. He's saying, here's a danger in the 70s he sees happening, right? It's giving itself into the organization, wait. Yeah. Western society has given itself the organization best suited to its purposes, based, I would say, on the letter of the law. The limits of human rights and righteousness are determined by a system of laws. Such limits are very broad. People in the West have acquired considerable skill in interpreting and manipulating the law. Any conflict is solved according to the letter of the law, and this is considered to be the supreme solution. If one is right from a legal point of view, nothing more is required. Nobody will mention that one could still be not entirely right and urge self-restraint. Right? It would sound simply absurd. Right? So the idea is like, you step my foot, I slip in front of your restaurant, or on your sidewalk, right? I'm going to sue you. I'm going to sue you, I'm going to get a million dollars in personal damages, right? If I get hit in a car wreck, I'm going to call a lawyer and on the billboard, right? Get all the money I can. If um, the government, like, you know, has a dump truck that's driving to go through my living room, well, if the government lawyer is able to beat me out of court, right, then the government's not wrong for doing that. Right, eminent domain, we're snatching up people's houses or whatever who live there forever to build Dodger Stadium in LA, right? 
or to build freaking um, add, add on to Wrigley Field or to build like the modern Olympics in Atlanta, right? People who've been living in a neighborhood for 50, 60 years, two generations, right? Government comes in and says, oh, land is ours. Here's as much money as we're getting it for it. You have no legal recourse to do this, right? Basically, if everything is resolved only to what is legally allowed, then how does morality, how does what's ethically right, how does personal philosophy come into the picture? But it doesn't, because you can say, well, I have a lawyer, I have Johnny Cochran on my side, right? I can pay whatever and do whatever, and he's gonna get me off. Right? You look at this as the way like Supreme Court decisions, not Supreme Court, but like lower court decisions are held today. And if you have a judge who'll be like, you know, maybe it's okay, Harvey Weinstein, six years or whatever, right? Like it's all about the money you have to pay for play the game and not about actually what's right or wrong. That's what he's saying here, right? The letter of the law, well it's good, right? Like it's good to have punishment for killing people or for like stealing stuff or for being a jackass, right? However, if you have a way to circumvent that, the letter of law does you no good in governing your society because people learn how to play that game, right? Right. It's kind of like the whole, you're sitting in the back of a car with your brother or sister, you're like, I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I'm like, but more or less, you're like poking them in the face, except like, like half an inch away. And so it doesn't count, but it should count, right? All right. Okay. If one is right from a legal point of view, nothing else is required. Nobody will mention that one can still not be entirely right and urge self-restraint. A willingness to renounce such legal rights, sacrifice, and selfish risk. It would simply be absurd. One of them almost never sees voluntary self-restraint. Everybody operates at the extreme limit of those legal frames, right? Like nobody's like, well, I could have one less cookie. Like, so why'd you just have a less cookie? Now there's a cookie there, I'm probably gonna eat it. Cookies are great, right? Don't you have self-restraint? you like, pretty like good and disciplined on cookies? I'm not. My children are worse, right? If I leave out a couple cookies, I'm like, everybody gets one cookie. Unless I'm guarding those cookies, the cookies are gonna be gone. Somebody's gonna have taken them, right? So it's like, like teaching ourselves to control ourselves morally for the right reasons or self-restraint as a practice, right? Maybe like a Hindu Buddhist kind of like, you know, deny the world just because you don't need everything at once kind of thing, right? Have enough to survive and be zen with everything, right? It's not really on the mind of people in America in 1978. It's like, Two cars in every driveway, two chickens in every pot, right? A white picket fence, 2.5 kids, a dog named Spot, right? Watching Flipper and Lassie on TV. I don't even know. Those are probably later than that. But anyways, like that's the American ideal, right? Is as much as you can possibly get, no restraint. So he spent all his life on a communist regime. He'll tell you that with a society without objective legal skill is a terrible one indeed. I mean, like, in Russia, right? Not really a law. If the secret police won't come and nab you up and execute you, they will. If your neighbor tells on you for like not loving Stalin enough, they'll come and nab you up and they'll execute you, right? They'll take your property like they did with you creating the farmers and the wheat, right? They'll take your car if you have a car, right? Um, so there's no real law. It's anarchy with the iron fisted government, right? Like that's not good. Uh, it's a terrible thing indeed. But a society with no other skill than a legal one is not quite worthy of man either, not quite worthy of humanity either, right? A society based on the letter of the law that never reaches any higher is taking very scarce advantage of the higher level of human possibility. The letter of the law is too cold and formal to have a beneficial influence on society. Does that make sense, right? So if we have just like a box of rules we shouldn't break, right? We don't have to care about whether or not I should be good to you or nice to you or polite to you or like a decent human being. All I have to worry about is like not getting prosecuted for being too much of a jackass, right? So if we have a legal skill that's only about breaking laws, then it's really hard to friggin', you know, have a society that's moral. Oh God. Time. Say we're still good. It's hard to have a society that's moral then, right? Whereas if you have a society with no laws, it's not good for the people in the, like, who are there to have safety, but there's some moral character that's developed, he says, right? Because if you don't have the government saying, don't steal all the food from the bacon, right? Like, if you decide not to do that, it's because you've worked it out as a moral thing to do, right? Like you think you and the baker and the candlestick maker and you know the boat maker down the street right have a little thing and you're trying to like, save yourself from the communist government coming and swooping y'all up. So you like talk to each other and care about each other and protect each other. Or if you don't, the helicopters come and snatch up for real, right? So it's more of an ethical society that thinks in hardship, right, in, uh, than in legally framework Western society, right? All right. Whenever the tissue of life is woven in legalistic regulation, regulations. There is an atmosphere of moral mediocrity, paralyzing man's noblest impulses. And it will be simply impossible to stand through the trials of this threatening century with only the support of a legalistic structure. In today's Western society, the inequality has been revealed in freedom for good deeds and freedom from evil. Wait, freedom for good deeds and freedom for evil deeds. 
A statesman who wants to achieve something important, highly constructed for his country, has to move cautiously and even timidly. There are thousands of hasty and irresponsible critics around him. Parliament and the press keep rebuffing him. As he moves ahead, he has to prove that each single step of his wealth that way, and each single step of his is, is well founded and absolutely flawless. Absolutely flawless. Actually, an outstanding and particularly gifted person who has an unusual and expect and unexpected initiatives in dozens of that in mind hardly gets a chance to assert himself. From the very beginning, dozens of traps we set out for him, thus mediocrity triumphs within the exclusive restriction imposed by democracy. Meaning like all our politicians, all our politicians, right? Are more or less people who are liars, who like have like either had their record expunged or never done anything really great or never any terrible, right? So all just kind of like saying the same vanilla crap that means nothing, right? If they had any real good ideas or actually wanted to change anything for real, right? Actually deal with inequity, deal with like violence, deal with like you know historical issues the United States has had, deal with oppression, deal with like criminal justice reform. We could do it. Like people could have an idea, and be like, hey, what's going on? That was effed up. Let's actually change it. But like all the media and all the people who are in charge of like politics would not like that. They'd be like, no, that's revolutionary. Go back away, right? So because of that, the only people who succeed in these like politically democratized fields are those who like suck the most, or at least are the most old-fashioned, no new ideas, or can cloud their like new ideas in like lies about how they're not going to be really new ideas, right? Which is why you have kind of like crappy ideas versus crappy ideas versus crappy ideas, and none of which actually changes anything every time we have like an election, right? Like the person who's like championing the ideas or saying new crazy random stuff, right? Or doing, saying that they're gonna do crazy stuff, right? Like, even if they are elected, it doesn't change a damn thing, right? Like, either way, because all the people who are actually running the government, the bureaucrats, the politicians who make laws, right? Are all mediocre pieces of crap who don't wanna actually change anything because so they wanna stay elected. That's what he's saying. I'm not saying that's true or false out loud, but I'm saying that that's what he's saying about democracy in general, right? It's a good idea if people are moral. If everybody's not moral and just cares about power, well, it's really easy to play the power game and make sure that you don't do anything new or cool, you're just in power forever. That make sense? Is this depressing? Does this make us want to go vote or not vote or play Xbox or not play Xbox? Do push-ups? No? It doesn't happen. Because I'm not going to do push-ups today for sure. Well, I'll read for me because my voice is getting hoarse. Um, boom, it's feasible. Is it feasible and easy for everyone to watch your life and then create your power and in fact, it has been drastically weakened in all of your country. The defense of individual rights has reached such a key as to make society as a whole defenseless against certain individuals. It's time that the West. Thank you. This sounds a bit weird, right? Does this sound weird to anybody else? No, we don't need to defend human rights. Like, maybe we have too much human rights. Does anybody think that's a true? We have too much human rights? Vote? Maybe not if we just like a yeah, human right, right, life, liberty, happy. Like, the International Declaration of Human Rights is what human rights are, right? I don't think anybody says there's too much of that, right? But what's he mean by human rights here? Like human rights that people have. What are you saying? Try to read between the lines. He says we, not need, we need not rights, but human obligations. What's a human obligation? Can anybody think of that? Like what is an obligation? To another human. If you're obligated to do something, you must. That's what? I suppose that, like, in a way, communism entails obligations, right? Usually to, like, Stalin or whoever's running the show, to the Communist Party, right? That's true. Um, I don't think those would be human obligations in the same way. Those are, like, governmental obligations, maybe. But yeah, that's an obligation. Somebody making you do something you don't want to freaking do, whether or not you want to do it, you're obliged to do it, forced to do it, yeah? What's the difference between forcing somebody to do something and them being obligated to do something? Small distinction. 
I know y'all from the top row know what that means. Y'all know what it means. Huh? Obligation versus forcer. If I'm obliged, if I'm obligated, right, towards you, like if I say I'll pay you 25 bucks tomorrow, right, for a, a sandwich you let me have some today, right, because I'm really hungry, then I'm obligated, morally speaking, right, to pay you 25 bucks. So I said I would, right? If I believe in, like, the equality of human life and, like, people are worth treating with dignity, right, I'm obligated to treat other people like that, right? It's something I put on myself because I view the world in a certain way, right, that then entails a certain future action from me. I buy a mortgage for a house, right? I'm obligated to pay it. If I don't, take my house. Our student loan debt, unfortunately, we are like obligated to pay. Maybe not, maybe there's ways around that, right? I'm trying to do this loan forgiveness thing, so the Marine Corps, fingers crossed on that. But like, if not, I'm obligated to pay it, right? Freaking, you buy something at the convenience store, you check, you scan it, you take it by the hot dog, right? You're obligated to pay for that. Some way or another, right? All right. What he means is that we need to start looking at our duties to other people as opposed to our own rights to do whatever the hell we want. Right? If we looked at the system of rights as not like, oh, I can you know, do X, Y, and Z, I can buy up a, a you know, you know, run down building in Atlanta, right, and turn into like a gentrified, bougie, hipster paradise with a coffee shop and like a Petco, right? If I maybe look at my obligations to other people, right, and like maybe my like people who have lived there forever, I'm trying to buy out a lower than they're paying for their rent or their mortgage, right? It'll make them force them out of the neighborhood. But maybe, like, I have an obligation to think about them too, right? Legally, I don't. Legally, I can do whatever I want with my money and buy whatever I want and screw whoever else had it, right? However, maybe that's not the best way to think about things, is what you're saying. Right. Okay. Right. Say what? So that's a good question. Do you think that's false? I think the way I think what you're saying sounds pretty false to me, right? Like all those human rights we got, right? All those like life, liberty, all like. I'm saying like it's like human rights. Okay, great, they're great. But sometimes all human right can sometimes be selfish instead of being doing what is actually right. Like saying, like say a parent, a young family, mom or dad, they can leave if they want. But they, they should, their, their obligation is to stay. Right. But they're right, they can leave if they want. And nobody's going to come get them, they can go back. They can like, give up their rights and their kids. That's, that's exactly right. That's exactly what he's trying to say. Yeah. Right? He's like, our human rights do whatever they have to want, right? Mm -hmm. Like, maybe not the most important thing. I mean, maximizing our freedom to do bad stuff, right, isn't the best way to go about making good stuff happen in the world, right? Oh, you're exactly, that's exactly the correct reading on it, right? And so we want to try to maximize human rights and spread human rights around the world, right? Well, what does that mean when more people start doing bad stuff because they're like allowed, we have the right to, you know, buy whatever property we want. We have the right to like, you know, drill a hole in the backyard and have oil come out. The right to leave, um, you know, a family or whatever. And nobody's going to like have us legally responsible for that or even like financially responsible for that, right? We can do whatever we want with our own time and money, like the right to pursue our whatever happiness we want, right? What was bad for the world? What was bad for us? What was bad for the people around us, right? And it's saying not, not that you need to have like, you know, the security state like Minority Report. You ever seen the Tom Cruise Minority Report? Oh, that's old, damn. Okay, I'm gonna have to come up with some new references. Like in the movie, there are like psychic cops that like can see crimes before you're gonna commit them. So they're always like hovering around and like, okay, you're gonna commit a crime, they'll go get you, right? To protect everybody from people's freedoms and exercising, right? Like, it's not like that, but it's like you should want to think about other people and consider your obligations to them so you don't want to be terrible, right? Just because you can. Right? Does it make sense? So what do you think a line is between, like, obligations and rights? How would we make that line in democracy, in our own lives, in a country like America or the West in general? How do you see that? I mean, know any, you know, ideas or ways to, like, balance that? Or how would you balance that in your own, you know, life? Like, you could hop in your car right now and, like, go drive over a bunch of prairie dog towns or through a dog park or into the, I don't know, the weird statue outside of the fountain. If you wanted to, you have the right kind of to do that, right? How do you balance that? Like, what do you consider as far as limiting the expression of rights because of other people? Some examples of that you can think of. In your own lives, in society, Think for a minute, we've kind of like 
Drop real fast through this, gonna take a second to ponder. I'm not playing thinking though. Looking at these masks you wear. Is that an example maybe of us being considerate or of us being obligated? I guess we're all forced to, right? By the universe. You're like, if you don't, you're gonna be, I don't know, thrown in COVID prison? I don't know what happens. Right? But we're, we do it out of consideration as well, right? We don't want other people to be uncomfortable, to be sick, or to be in danger, right? right? So our right to, like, look amazing with our new haircuts and our new, like, you know, newly groomed hair, newly pulled nose hairs, and, like, shaved unibrow, right? So I stopped doing entirely like, since COVID, right? Um, I give up that to wear a mask because it's helpful to everybody and because I'm required, you're right? But the voluntary act of doing that is for the public good more, right? That's what I said. All right. Do, do, do. We'll go ahead and stop there today, actually, just because that's pretty dense and we're about halfway through. So I want to talk about a couple other things, though, policy side, since I've been recording this lecture, which I now stop, thank God, because...